you this week? Not being able to talk to everybody this week was actually pretty weird. Um, after building that habit for how long now? 14 months, something to their effect. Um, I miss you guys. I'm glad we're here. Wow. <laughs> that's, the, that's the long and short of it is, you know, Monday and Friday, while I had a wonderful week and was able to relax and get a whole bunch of stuff done, it did feel a little bit odd not to have you guys in my life every morning. So we're here. Same. I feel absolutely the same. Oh my God, do I see the coach? So we're simulcasting again. So here on Fridays and Mondays, uh, we're going to be doing the live stream from both Clubhouse and YouTube and Facebook Live. So it should be blasting out everywhere. I don't have the, ca the capability to kind of watch everything in real time. So I'm just trusting the internet gods that it's going out there somewhere. So keep your fingers crossed. And uh, I do have to apologize for Monday when we tried this before. I had uh, contractors come into my house and shut the power off because they thought they they were able to do that. So we lost everything, lost the stream, lost power. By the time I could get it all back and running again, it just wasn't worth it. So uh, I apologize for <laughs> the debacle on Monday. <laughs> It's funny, too, that we tested it all the week before and everything ran fine. And then the day we go official with Mondays and Fridays, everything fell apart. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Murphy. And hi, coach. I would miss the shit out of you. Hi, guys. How are you? David. Sir. <laughs> Hey, David, how are you? I'm well, thanks for asking. I saw your face down there and got really excited. So <clears throat> really good to hear your voice and glad to uh, snag you up and have you with us for at least a little while today. Yeah, it's good to slip in and see my friends and see this group still doing all the greatness that it's been doing for, <laughs> seems like since Clubhouse birth, need to come back in. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, I guess. It's been, been a long haul. <laughs> but <clears throat> I see we've got some friends also joining us in the audience today. Carla and Erica, Don and Aaron and Carol, Joan and Anita, Ashanta and John and Nancy. So glad to see you all this morning. I hope your week was amazing. Um, real quick, just want to say hi to the rest of the mods before we get started. Hi, Basam and Kat and Becca. How is everybody this morning? doing really well just felt a bit weird this week to have the mornings kind of clear big part of my life missing this week but i'm glad we're here this morning me too matt and i were just chatting about how weird it felt not to be together in the mornings this week yeah i missed that i guess <laughs> missed your chat anyways me too cat becca how are y'all Good. I uh, I have these uh, jade plants that have some like spider growth on them and it's like creating this weird like ash fuzz on them. So I was doing all of this research yesterday like, all right, how do I get rid of this stuff? It's killing my plants. And it's just like one quarter alcohol to three parts water. And I've just been sitting here with a Q-tip. It's been like meditation, like these tiny little jade plant leaves like going over every single one. Uh, but other than that, I'm great. <laughs> other than plant doctoring. Huh? <laughs> Becca, how about you? Slowly returning to the land of the living. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome back. Glad to have you in the land of the living. Oh. I will be picking up, and um, as everybody knows right now, I'm single mom in it in the morning, so forgive me if you hear the sounds in the background. I'm getting the kiddo ready for school and getting everybody up and moving, but that's just part of life. So let's go ahead and get started this morning, and I will begin by saying good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Morning Walk and Art Talk with the Artist Forge, where we learn to think like artists. My name is Nicole York. I'm going to be your host. Today, I am joined by your regular moderators, Matt. 
Oh, excuse me. I almost fell over. Matt Stagliano and Bassam Seba and Kat Ford Coates and Becca Bjorki and by original founding member, David Parrish. So glad to have everybody with us this morning as we get into our new schedule of Mondays and Fridays. Hopefully your week was amazing, but we're so glad to have you with us today as we discuss the best piece of practical advice we could give to other artists. So we're moving into a schedule where Monday will be focused more on mindset and Friday will be fo focused more on practical advice. And what better way to get us started off than by just jumping in and asking folks, what is the best piece of practical advice they could give to artists? And for a long time, the main focus of our conversations has always been things like mindset and philosophy, and it's gonna stay that way. Um, but sometimes those can get a little bit of esoteric and it requires a lot of work out of our audience to think about how these things might apply to them and do some work of internal reflection and see how they can or if they should take some of the advice or some of the concepts we talk about and apply those to their own lives and practices. But Fridays, we wanna make sure that we're also giving some practical advice, something that an artist could take and put to work for themselves and see if it applies. So that's basically today's question is what piece of practical advice would you give to other artists? And I'll go ahead and start us off just for the sake of giving everybody a little bit of time to think. If you're in the audience this morning and you have an idea of what piece of practical advice you would give, um, go ahead and feel free if you would like to raise your hand and we will get to you, I promise. If you don't want to be able to share that um, with your voice, the chat is open so you can always go and put your thoughts in the chat room, but that is the conversation. So let's get as much good advice gathered in one place as possible. So we'll start with mine this morning while everybody has a chance to think. And that is make it as easy for people to buy your work as possible. And I mean that in several different ways. I mean that in part from a user experience perspective. So if you have somebody show up to your website or show up to a gallery or wherever it is that they purchase your work, the fewer steps, sorry, we have the cold in my house right now. Um, the fewer steps you have to go through in order to purchase a piece of work, the more likely it is that you're gonna complete that purchase. If I have to click 8 million clicks on a new website and read seven things and sign something and do everything else to get to that piece of work, it is going to test my desire for that work. If it is really, really easy to buy, if I have a nice experience buying, if I don't have to struggle and fight and call somebody and do everything else, there is a much higher likelihood that I'm going to buy your work. This is from a retail perspective, okay? Things might be a little bit different on the commercial side. So I mean that from a user experience perspective, but I also mean that from a creation perspective. If you sell your art in the retail market, but I don't know what to do with it, and it requires me being a creative buyer, there's a really good chance I might not buy the work at all. If I look at it and go, that's neat, but what do I do with it? Where do I put it? Um, I, might, I might just look for art that doesn't require so much of me. And this is from a statistical perspective, not from an individual niche perspective. So it is important to understand your market and know your individual demographic, what they want out of art. As an example, um, Matt has talked before about the fact that for a long time, he was really wanting his customers to buy prints and then realized over time that for many of them, their needs just did not encompass prints on the wall or they may not have very much wall space. And if you live in a place where the average home size is not very large, selling gigantic prints may not be the best bet for getting people to buy. You really need to understand the end use of your art and consider that in the creation for your retail pieces. Now you might have fine art pieces or other pieces that are much more niche and require more of your buyer, but in order to make a living, you need to be considering the audience in your creation process so that the end goal is giving them something usable. Um, so that would be 
my big piece of practical advice is make it as easy to buy your work as possible. Less clicks, faster checkouts, make things available, however it is that you have to do it from a user experience perspective. And then just thinking about that in the creation of your art. How easy is it for somebody to know what to do with it, how to use it, where to put it? Does it fit into their general use of art? Know your audience so that you can figure that stuff out. So that would be my practical advice. And if anybody wants to respond to that or maybe fight me on it too, that's cool. Um, I would I would love to have that conversation. But if not, I would love to hear Matt, David, Bassam, Kat, Becca, is there a piece of practical advice that you would give to artists, something they might be able to just put to use right away? And if you're in the audience today and you want to share, don't be afraid to raise your hand or head over to the chat. So Nicole, I think the the overall idea of making it easy for people to do business with you is like this big umbrella. Like what are the the tangible components you can create for that client experience, that success journey, if you will, like, so that you offer those solutions, right? Because some of those clients, like as a photographer, maybe your personal branding clients, they don't need prints and that's great. Like that's better for your profit margin and your bottom line, uh, because I hope everybody in the room is charging the same for their, their digital as they are for their baseline print size. But you can even have two separate menus with the same prices right? And say, okay, if you're just looking for digitals, then I'm going to submit this menu to you, you know, that outlines those digital collections. Are they digital? Are they shifted in price by the size of the digital that you're delivering? Is it web res and full size? You know, they, they should probably have different values uh, based on your print model, right? Like, because why would I sell somebody a five by seven right? And then deliver them a full res file. And I know there's some the argument that could be made there. Um, but if I'm going to sell you a 30 by 40 for $2,000, then why wouldn't I sell the digital file for that same 30 by 40 for the same price? So what are some, what are some specific things that people can do to make that, that simplification just as simple as you're hoping it will be? That's some fantastic insight there. And I think that's the important part of really understanding your audience and then your business. And I know um, I, I would want to poke Matt a little bit on this one because I know coming to the decision to be able to sell digitals was one that took you a little while and some consideration for how that was going to be practical for your business as well as serving your clients. So I'm wondering, Matt, um, did you kind of, or how did you, I should say, move through that process of okay, I, I'm seeing that my clients want this. This is not initially where I wanted to go. So how do I still fit that into the practical aspect of my business, like Kat was saying? I think it comes down to a couple of things. The first being, you know, know your audience, like Kat was saying. Um, for me, I'm still working through it. I'm still a little bit weird with it because I love print so much. And I think there's such a valuable part of the process that just providing digitals, while perfectly fine, just feels weird to me. I feel like, hey, you're paying all this money. Let's give you more. Let's give you prints and art and albums and all of this sort of stuff. Like you just don't just want the digitals, do you really? And when they're like, yeah, I just need the digitals. I'm like, okay, that's cool. But like Kat said, I keep everything priced the same way. I think for me, you know, it was a little bit hard because I had built up in my mind so much that this is what I value and this is what I believe. And I really wasn't, you know, thinking too much about the customer. I was like, why would they not want this? So once I realized, put my ego aside and said, it's not about me. It's about knowing your audience, knowing your customers, serving them with what they want. Um, but understanding that you're in business and you don't need to cheapen anything, just give them what they want. And that's really how I work through it. And it bothers me much less. I still believe in the value of prints and art and albums and all the physical tangible pieces because I screw up technology so much I'm bound to lose all of my digitals at some point so having that physical thing means a lot to me that doesn't mean that it has the same effect 
um, on other people. They don't necessarily might not hold those same values. So I can't just discard their wants and needs. I've got to cater to that. That's why I'm in business. So once I kind of shifted that little bit of perspective, it ain't about me. Um, things really started to, to fall into place. For sure. And then what were some of the, the practical decisions that you made? So did you um, say, you know, the value is not necessarily in the paper and ink, it's in the creation of the art. And so the pricing is going to be commensurate with, commensurate, excuse me, with the, uh, the pricing that the print would be, um, as Kat was suggesting, did you like, was there any other practical things that you considered and how you price these and how you sell these so that you kind of maintain the value of your work? I stopped referring to them as digital or print. I just call it the image. You're buying the image. How you want that image delivered to you is up to you. You can get digital and print and art. You're buying the image. There are costs associated with different things like the add-ons, but you're buying the image. So if you buy the digital image, you're also going to get the print if you want it because you're buying the image itself. And that's the service that I provide. If you only want the digital, don't want the print, or only want the print, don't want the digital, that's perfectly up to you. I just explain, you're buying the image. Here's how it comes out of the box. You choose what you want. Um, but I try to stay away from the digital versus print conversation when it comes to pricing because it doesn't matter. Um, your, I, I design my pricing so that everything is consistent whether it's digital, whether it's print, packages, a la carte, doesn't matter. Everything is consistent. So there's no way that someone can come in and mathematically chip apart my menu so that they say, ah, well, digitals are cheaper. I don't do that. I've already thought that all through. So um, I just make it about the image and focus on that rather than the medium that the, the image comes in. Makes perfect sense. If anybody yeah. wants to jump in there. Oh, yep. Yeah, I want, I want to jump in without repeating much because what Matt just said is extremely important is to have clarity on what is it you're selling and how do you how do you make sure it's consistent? We talked about that before. You could describe it really well, Matt. I've always said to my clients, or at least maybe not in those words, you know, the values in the image, the container doesn't matter, right? So whether there is a container or no container, whether it's a box, whether it's an album, whether it's just a... a, a USB or a, or a digital send by we transfer. Um, so so the uh, so I went through the same process where I, I you know I built my business on 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 prints and 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 uh, folio boxes and reveal walls and, and albums and so on and and then I realized like everybody else that some people just want the digital. So I went through the same process that went that Matt went through and others have gone through. And uh, just one kind of a. Uh, to tell you where I struggled a bit more, I didn't have an issue with saying, you know, you know, digitals versus uh, versus prints. I was able to do that, that shift, mind shift. Um, I uh, I did create three different price lists, uh, even though the actual content and the pricing is exactly the same. But I catered them to digital versus other types of work, uh, other types of products. Where I struggled, though is uh, because I do have packages, and I say that and I think of David, who I had a discussion with once, and he says, why do you have packages? Just sell by the print, but that's a different discussion. Because I have packages, where I struggled was, it's easier to, to find value, or at least add value as you go up to a bigger and bigger package when you have a print, when you have an album, when you have a bigger album, a bigger box, a, a better thing in Bob, right? because you're going up in backage over and above the number of images. But when it comes to digitals, I struggled in finding, as I go from say eight images to 15 to 20 to 30, what other value can I add in there when they're simply digitals, right? Um, so so that, that was the part that was a, a bit more, a more difficult to deal with as opposed to the basic concept of separating, you know, separating the, the the products and so on. And, and, you know, I have some consistency there in terms of some of the added value, for example, as you move up in products, you, uh, you know, you get a, you know, you, you, you become a client for life. If you buy my biggest package, you never have to pay a session fee and things like that, that are consistent across. Uh, but I still, am a little bit um, unsure about, is there enough value in, in going, you know, that would bring people to the bigger package when it's a digital only. And if anybody has any ideas there, I would I would welcome them. 
Oh, resize, resize, resize. Yeah. Well, resize, resize, and and uh, and maybe other formats, adding other formats than just the digital image itself, whether it's social media. That's one thing I, I'm thinking about doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have web collections, and then if you want a full res file, you know, that's a different price point. Um, and for anybody who does kind of run and gun, so a lot of times when I'm on the road for like these networking ladies, um, I have a buy just the straight out of camera option too. Uh, so like you can buy my digital collections at, you know, with full retouch for individual images, you choose, we talk through the editing you want to see, that kind of thing. And that's at my like full bore pricing. But I also have like, look, if you just want everything because you can see a use for it on like your Instagram or social, like I will go through and like color and like correct and, you know, make sure that everything's cohesive when it's delivered. But if you want it at web size, you can have everything for 1500. If you want it at full res, then you can have it for 2500. Right. I'm still not editing anything. I'm just running it through Lightroom, taking away, you know, the blinks and the out of focus stuff uh, and presenting that to them. And one of the things that has seemed to work is some of the ladies, they're like, well, I want everything, but I really want some of them retouched still. And I say, look, if you want me to retouch, say, five of those images, like with the full retouch, they're going to go on your website and your email signature and that kind of thing. I'm happy to do that up to five images if you purchase the full res files. So if you're making that $2,500 investment, I will go through and I'm going to retouch five of those, your choice. Uh, and, and that sort of acts as a pull through. Like, I'm not going to sit down and do that for a $1,500 rah, rah, rah on, you know, a, an abbreviated session, but I can use that editing as the pull through as well. For studio work, like it's literally just web size or full res, your choice. Uh, and then, you know, the, the editing is, of course, you know, more of a signature statement there. Um, and that's where that, that dollar value comes into play. Yeah. By the way, maybe I, I, I forgot to specify, and, and, and as you talked, that made me think. I I offer digitals for personal branding only, so my separate pricing for personal branding is digitals. And what you just described made me think that one of the one of the tenets of what I do is that if you're coming in for personal branding, whether you take three pictures, eight pictures, or 20 pictures, you're still there for business slash personal branding, which means you need to get the quality of the images that you need to do whatever you'd like to do with. So I, I fundamentally, I, I, you know, my basic package, or at least what you get by uh, through buying an image is the full resolution file, which to me is the equivalent of what you're getting an album or you're getting a box. So, so, so I've kind of restricted from myself from, 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 from uh, offering low res versus high res because I want the basic service, the basic product they get to be a usable product for personal branding, business branding, sure. and advertising. Is that you can't offer two different formats of those files because yes, I want you to be able to, to leverage these images to generate revenue in your business. That's the purpose, but the value is in the imagery itself. So if you have your collections, you know, you can have basically like folio box collections, but as a digital only product, at web resolution for X amount, and that would be your baseline, and then an inflated amount for the full resolution. Because if I come to you for personal branding, I'm going to get a lot more traction if I have full license to use, whether it's projected on the side of a church in Boston or on a billboard versus, yeah. you know, on, on my Instagram or my Facebook or my LinkedIn. Uh, and understanding that there is added value there in the larger size of that digital file. No, I, I get that. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm miscommunicating or anyway, let's move on. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, yeah. I mean, this is definitely a conversation that we can have, um, that we can have. And I would like to continue that in Facebook land for the photographers as well, because um, you know, this is, this is an interesting territory that we've moved into as far as usage goes um, and things that we have to consider for how we sell. So um yeah let's let's continue that there and what we've talked about so far practical advice for artists if you're just joining us today the first piece of practical advice being make it as easy for your clients to purchase from you as possible both from a user perspective 
and from knowing what they can do with your art um, and making sure that you understand your demographic enough that the art that you create fits within their usable range. So that being the first piece of practical advice and then looking at some different applications of that for photography. So for the rest of the folks on the panel today, what would be the best piece of practical advice you would give to an artist? I think the thing when you, when you pose the question, one of the things that popped into my mind is something that I've been hearing from different instructors for years, for about a decade from training with firearms to training with a camera. The thing that I get all the time and keeps bringing me back is slow down, just slow down. I get so in the moment and want to take all the pictures and want to make everything right. And I'm running back and forth and I'm frantic. Or if I'm, you know, trying to set up a set, I'm trying to overthink it. And a lot of it comes down to just relaxing, slowing down, take a look at what you're doing. Forget about the technical side of things and just reconnect with yourself, connect with your client and think about what it is that you're trying to create. You don't need, now I struggle with this next part. I overshoot, overshoot, overshoot because I'm paranoid of missing that microsecond where it's perfect connection with the camera. But if I slow down, I surprisingly can create that moment much more intentionally than just trying to grab for it. So if I slow down my process and think and really compose and really look at the light, for me, it's a much more relaxing experience. And it's hard to stay in that place because we want to do so many things at once. So for me, it's always just slow down, not only in the actual act of shooting, but also in the business, right? We want to do all the things we want to do social, we want to do marketing, we want to do networking, we want to do editing, we want to, you know, all the parts of the business. And if we just slow down and approach it all with a little bit of intention and understand that the word priority means singular, you can only have one priority, you can't have multiple priorities. So just know what that priority is, slow down, approach it logically, and you'll find that a lot of things start to fall into place without having to force it. Um, but when you're trying to do all the things at once, then it just never works out as well. It never really comes across as polished because there's always this hectic, frantic side to things. So for me, it's always slow down, slow down in thinking, slow down in shooting, slow down in everything. And you might find you might enjoy the process a little bit more. Yeah, I love that advice. Um, I've spoken to many, many new photographers and uh, and had to cover that exact piece of advice because they do exactly what you mentioned. They get um, the pressure, I think, also gets to them and the excitement gets to them. And then the desire to appear as if they know exactly what they're doing and make sure that the client has no, no idea that they're starting to panic. Um, is there and so they just continue to shoot and shoot and shoot even when things aren't working and i love the advice of slow down and you know give yourself a minute and realize that the best way to prove that you know what you're doing is just by doing what you know and you already know these things so give yourself a minute to actually do them and think your way through them um and and know that that's okay yeah i love that if anybody else has anything they want to respond to in that piece of advice, that would be fantastic. Are we having also, Matt, any comments um, from the Facebook land or anywhere else? If we do, um, make sure that we're getting yeah. to those as well, Coach. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Go ahead, Matt. Oh, absolutely. So Sharon is just Sharon Spencer's in the room. And she's just saying, good morning. Finally caught the simulcast. That's great. And then there's another Facebook user um, who's saying, that's so true what Matt's saying about slowing down and working intentionally. I do my best work when I slow the F asterisk ck <laughs> down so um i appreciate the self-censoring um but yeah that's it Got to, those are the comments so far love it go ahead coach yeah i was gonna piggyback off of what matt was saying and then lead into my best advice but um you know i was a soldier for a really long time and we always had especially as an infantry man, we had this saying that slow is smooth and smooth is fast 
And what we mean by that is, you know, when you slow down in those moments, you collect everything. You don't panic. You don't get frustrated. You don't miss the small details. And because you've slowed down and you've become smooth in your actions, smooth is speed. Uh, it's much better to be fluid than to be in a hurry. Uh, fluidity will make sure that you're hitting all your all your benchmarks and making sure that you're taking all of your knowledge to the table. Um, and so, you know, and also recognizing when you're in that quicksand moment and finding a way to break out of it. So those quicksand moments are when you realize you've made a mistake or things aren't working right. They'll quickly lead to that. If I struggle more and more and more and more, I'm going to sink this whole thing. So realizing when you're in those moments and finding a way to take a pause, take a breath, take a break, you know, excuse yourself to the restroom, whatever you need to do to just be able to look at, all right, let's rein it in versus frantically struggling against the tide in an effort that's only going to sink you. Um, so that's kind of my relation to what Matt said. My best advice is, if you're going to call yourself a, a something, you have to do the something, right? So before you can be a noun, you got to do the verb. And I think as artists, we forget that. At first, we can't help but do the work. But as soon as we make the work a business, then all of a sudden we're waiting for commissions. We're waiting for shoots. And we're spending all the rest of our time trying to do the hustle to bring people in. And if you go with the, you know, you got to do the verb to be the noun thing. Now all you are is a hustler. You've kind of forgot all the things that you love and all of the reasons why you started this thing because you're not really doing it anymore. You're waiting for the commission. You're waiting for the work to come in before you start doing the shooting or the painting or the whatever. You have to continue to create constantly or you'll forget why you love it and your skills will go downhill. David and I are on the same wavelength this morning. I, that was exactly where I was going to go also thinking as a follow-up uh, to Matt. Um, but the idea of practice, 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 practice. Oh my goodness. Practice, particularly deliberate practice, like, like David was just saying, where you're going to lose those skills. And I think this is something a lot of us, once we move into professional space or, you know, any kind of, I don't comfort in our art form or our business or whatever it is that we like to do, we stop practicing and we stop doing the simple things that we started doing when we were first learning whatever that skill is. And it kind of inhibits our greater, deeper understanding of the thing. So being very deliberate with the practice, like I'm going to play warm ups on the piano or I'm going to do, I don't know, a study. I'm going to study the shadow on the side of my house and sketch that out with a pencil, even if it's something I know I can do that, but the more you do it, the deeper you're gonna understand it and the deeper you're gonna understand it, the better you're gonna be able to serve anyone who's interacting with you in whatever capacity. I love that a lot. There are a lot, and there are a lot of, at least in, in the photo space, there are a lot of photographers that will only shoot if they're being paid for it. And I was even in that space for a hot minute. Um, and then I realized, like, if I'm only creating for somebody else's vision and their design, then I'm not even doing the thing that I set out to do to begin with, right? And so being able to, to whether it's shoot or paint or draw or, you know, insert thing here, it's I've got to be able to create for the love of the creation and the, the visions that I carry. Otherwise, it's a moot point. And then you're just, you know, you might as well be a technician somewhere. Uh, and I'm not in business to be a technician. So I really love that, the act of practice, uh, regardless of how long you've been doing the thing, um, just for the sake of it and the love of it, because that's why you started in the first place, or at least that's why I did. Um, and I would actually add as that practical piece of advice to, you know, getting control of your calendar, um, especially like at the beginning and saying, I'm going to shoot here. I'm going to have personal time here. I'm going to work out here. I'm going to, you know, have friend time here, you know, whatever the things are and really kind of mapping that out before the steamroll starts. Like I'm doing a lot of backpedaling right now with my calendar because I'm just underwater with 17 million different things. And had I sat down long enough to just 
map those things out ahead of time, that that pressure is alleviated when you're in the thick of things. I am so glad that you brought that up, Kat, because um, I know I have complained about that many times, but man, if I had taken that advice and really just been in control of my calendar beforehand, um, it would have alleviated so much stress. And I would have been able to look at the job offerings I had coming in and other things that were going on so that I could actually know whether or not I could take that work without wanting to pull my hair out or just jump off a cliff because yeah. Oh, I, I, that's one of those practical pieces of advice that are not related to art, like specifically, you know what I mean? That I really hope people take them. Yeah. It seems like such a simple thing and like, Oh, you know, I can adapt and deal with it as it comes, but Oh man. Oof. Yeah, for real. And I think um, it's important to remember when we're thinking about that, that there are going to be some seasons where we're just extra busy, right? And we accept that and we recognize that sometimes sometimes that work comes in, in bursts and we want to take advantage of those things while we have them there, but also not to the point where we're not able to take care of ourselves anymore, you know, where we're losing our chance for um, personal time or for exercise or for all of the other things we know are so important. Um, we, I think, should be scheduling those things into our calendar in advance so that we can actually fully take advantage of those busy seasons when they come around. Because if we work ourselves into the ground, the chance that we're going to even be around for the next busy season without burning out, I mean, that starts to get relatively low. I think time management, you know, when I was learning to do financial budgeting, when I was released into the world, and you know, without a lot of ever thought about how the real world works with money, I was told over the course of like a month to carry three by five cards and write down all of the expenses that I did in order to understand where money was going. And I think the same thing is true with your time. If you take the effort to understand how your time is being used on a regular basis, you'll understand where you have the ability to save and or shift because you know i mean if we're real we live in a culture where people will say they don't have time but they'll find time for example to sit in front of netflix and watch a show for an hour or binge watch an entire season of something over the course of a few days while that's needed sometimes i would say the intentionality of stepping into that for the right purposes you set your mind to this is rest and relaxation before you do it you're going to get more out of it but it's also just understanding where your time goes i'm still like on my computer i still use rise as an application to know where my computer time goes um, and all it does is just record what i'm doing on my computer Do we lose the coach? I think so. Since this time. Oh, right. there you're back. I got a phone call on that. I didn't realize it would cut me off. Um, so, you know, I just think knowing and budgeting your time or knowing where your time is going so that you can properly allocate it where you want is so important. So it's just a good, good, really loud old car. Um, it's just a really good way to use your time effectively, I think. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned the difference between free time, right, which is time that can be spent for anything and personal time, which is time that we really have set aside for ourselves, because I think you're right. For many of us, we can spend our time like we spend our money a little bit mindlessly and not realize where all of the time goes during the day. Um, and so it's, I think, a really, really important distinction to make because we do need that free time. My teapot is, is ready. Um, we do need that free time. We need that rest and relaxation time. But, you know, you're right. Some of the time that we spend during the day that could be going towards our business or could be going towards networking or marketing or making a new piece or whatever it is, gets spent a little bit mindlessly in front of a screen when we don't even realize that that's what we're doing. So I, I think it is really important to make that distinction. I'm glad you did. And I think lastly on that is, you know, when you're off track on 
your budget, it's it's okay to, I, I don't know, think of time like it is a, a financial situation because arguably it is the most valuable thing we have on the planet. Um, but, you know, when you're going to enter into those busy seasons, setting down and saying, hey, you know, I don't know, for the metaphoric way, this is Christmas. This is going to cost us more money this month than it normally does. So if you're entering into your busy season, yeah, this is going to cost you more time than it normally does. But just like a bank account, you need to find the time to put that money back or put that time back into your bank. You can't just burn it and never replace it. You have to be able to say, all right, yeah, this is my busy season, but this is my strategy to get all that back and get it back in place so that I don't reach burnout. Pay yourself first kind of thing. And then recognize, you know, um, that sometimes we are investing time now so we can have more time later. But you're right. I mean, if we make if we make those decisions without making sure that we follow through with the I will have more time later thing, then it's it's really like burning dollar bills. Um, so that's an important thing to think about. We are about 20 minutes from the end today. And I want to make sure if we have friends in the audience who have thoughts that they want to share about practical advice they would give to artists as well. Um, don't be afraid to raise your hand because we'd love to bring you up or go ahead and share that in the chat. Yeah, Nicole, I got a question from Sharon here in the, uh, in the Facebook chat saying as a newer business or as a newer artist, sometimes it's hard not to say yes to everything because you're trying to make a name for yourself. How do you navigate that? What's some practical advice around that when you're trying to grow, trying to make a name for yourself and manage your calendar and manage all the things um, without saying yes to everything? What's your advice on that? Ooh, that's great. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear from everybody else before I share mine. Um, what do you guys think? How would you manage that from a new artist perspective? Do you say yes to everything? Do you budget your time? How do you, how do you make those decisions? I, I, yeah, I can argue. I can argue both sides, especially for a starting artist or a starting photographer or, or or whatever your your craft is. Is that when you're starting, you're usually and inevitably looking for um, your place, looking for uh, your style, and so on, developing, learning, and and saying yes. I wouldn't say to everything, but saying yes more often could be. A learning experience could open up opportunities. So, so kind of set yourself up and structure your time in a way that allows you to be flexible and do different things. Because you still may not have clarity about how do I, you know, what am I focused on and what do I want to focus on. So, I can argue that on that end. The question is very valid: is is how do you not say yes to everything and how do you control it? Now, and again, it's it all for me. It all depends on the level of maturity of where you are in your in 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 clarity about what you want to do in life or what you want to be. You, you know, one of the things that stuck out, I've been writing down the notes of all the practical advice that we've been spitting out here for the past 43 minutes. Um, and I was just going through the list, make it easy for your customers, slow down, get control of your calendar. You're not going to be a new artist forever. So start putting in the habits that you would have if you were an old artist right? So get control of your calendar, figure out how you want things to run, figure out what you want your life to look like, and start writing that down, start visualizing that, start moving towards that. Make it easy for your customers. So have all your processes and workflows in place, understand what your pitches are going to be, and then slow down and look at the project that you're being asked to do or the client that's coming in. Do you want to say yes to that? I think once you start building the good habits of how you want your business to run, how you want your um, artistic endeavors to roll out, once you have control over that, then you're not a new artist and you don't have to say yes to everything. All you're doing is building in those habits that are going to give you longevity without the burnout. And um, so there's really nothing, you know, in hindsight, looking back that that I would say you need to do any differently. Think about your business as having been in business for 10 years. What would you be doing? What would it look like perfectly? And start reverse engineering that. And what can I do today to make that a reality?
So, you know, just a couple of things that we've already covered so, so far, slowing down, you know, making it easy for your customers, getting control of your calendar, all super practical pieces so that you can decide what works for your business and what doesn't, what you can say yes to and what you don't have to. So that would be my my advice on that. And I think along those same lines is why are you saying yes? Is it coming from a place that you're seeking fame or you're running away from fear? I think often the reason we say yes, especially at the beginning, is because you're waiting or you need a payday. You need this thing to go forward. But is that coming from fear? Because fear is not a very good place to operate from. So if it's coming from a place of scarcity, you're probably already wrong with wanting to say yes. Because if you get into that scarcity mindset, you're going to keep it probably for a very, very long time versus if you just smash it from the get go. And, you know, there's very, very extensive research done in successful entrepreneurs, techniques that they did. And almost without fail, you are, well, actually, you're about 33% more likely to be successful as an entrepreneur if you keep your day job. Um, and I think what that helps you do is while you're working two jobs, it gives you the ability to focus on what you really want to do versus just saying yes to everything because you need the money, you need the payday. And I just think from Jump Street as an artist, as a business person, the more that you can run away from the scarcity and the fear, the more likely you're going to be successful down the road. Man, I love that you brought up the scarcity component, David. Um and I know it's a little late in the in the game to to delve too deep into that, but since we're talking about you know tangible practical things that that we can do, um, what are some practices that you guys have when you feel that kind of rise up? Like, uh oh, I got to make some cash. I got to you know book X Y Z and da 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 da. Like, how do you step from that space when you feel that rise up? Like, and recognize it for what it is. And then what actions can you take to get out of that, to shake that loose? I mean, most easily for me, if I feel anxiety about the yes, then it should be a no. You know, if the, if the yes doesn't come easy and without some making me feel yucky about it, all right, then, then that's probably a solid yes. If, if I'm feeling some level of anxiety or, you know, fear or anything related to saying yes, then then maybe I, I need to map that out a little bit more. Because, you know, there are big jobs, of course, that you're like, man, this is the biggest job I've ever done. That's going to come with anxiety. But, you know, you have the skill set after you mind map it and you look at it you're like, yeah, I can actually do this. So the anxiety is not founded. But then there's this whole other level of yuckiness that's just like, this is not the direction I saw myself going. And that's times where probably that yes needs to be a no. I love that. Um, and I think that that's, that is pretty fantastic advice, knowing where the anxiety comes from surrounding whether you say yes or no to an opportunity. If it's one of those things where, you know, ooh, it's just going to be a lot on my shoulders and it's going to be kind of scary. Well, then that's probably a good opportunity for growth. But if it's one of those, God, I don't know if I have time for this and I, you know, I've got so much else going on and this isn't really the direction I saw myself going and those kind of questions, then, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really good possibility that that should end up not being on your plate. Um, and stepping out of that scarcity mindset, I think when it comes to having those feelings arise and then trying not to make decisions based on them, for me, actually kind of goes back to one of the things that David mentioned already, which is knowing or providing myself a way out for that. So knowing I have either saved up enough or I know I can get those clients or I have in a way a kind of mental and, and physical safety net so that saying no does not mean the end of everything. Um, that allows me to do that. And also I think going back and remembering the jobs have always been there. Like I, I always have had enough jobs and if I would not allow myself to spiral and panic, if, if I look back over the course of my career, I've always had enough work. 
So a lot of those fears are just unfounded. And I think remembering that also can really help, um, which leads me a little bit into want, I mean, some answer that I wanted to make sure that I gave um, for Sharon's question on you know, how you how you do that, how you make those decisions. One thing is, it might not always be bad to say yes to everything right off the bat, just to get a feel because you may have people show up with job opportunities that you never had planned for yourself. And then you do the job and realize, I really loved that. Um, and sometimes there are experiences that you can get and bring with you into other work that you never would have had if you wouldn't have said yes to something unexpected. Um, and also, when I started my career, I started as a portrait photographer, and I don't want to be a portrait photographer. But I didn't know that. I had to do that first. I had to do that in multiple ways. I had to do that at weddings. I had to do that um, for businesses. I had to do that for individuals and families. Like I needed to go through those paces to realize that that wasn't what I wanted. I knew I wanted to make work, and I knew I wanted to be paid for my work, and I knew, you know, I knew those things. But I wouldn't have realized that I didn't want certain aspects of it until I had done the thing. Um, and so that's just something to think about. It's not necessarily the same advice I would give to every individual, but I wouldn't always immediately step away from saying yes to everything in the beginning. I might, I might really give some things a go just to see if they fit. But the other thing I wanted to make sure that I brought up before we pull up, we've got a couple hands up with Juliet and Carol, so we'll grab you guys. Um, but the other thing I wanted to just reiterate um, is to give yourself, I, I think of them as like the tripod legs of my, I don't know, foundation or stool, but I have three things that every question must pass in order to move on to the next phase of consideration. And that is, does it help me tell stories? Does it help me help other people tell stories? And does it contribute to the health, happiness, and welfare of my family? So those three things are kind of a litmus test for anything that comes across my path. If it doesn't pass those things, it doesn't make it through to the consideration phase. And that way I'm able to really weed out the things that don't fit with my philosophy of how I want to live my business and my art life. If it doesn't pass those things, it doesn't move on to the next phase. So that's just one thing you might be able to put in the uh, in the mix there as a way to filter out those different things. So we want to make sure that the mods have a last chance to respond before we have um, Carol and Juliet share their thoughts. Nothing else, y'all? No, I think it's been well covered. Killer. Okay, so Carol and Juliet have both had their hands up. I think Carol had hers up first. So as we come to the end of the hour, um, if you are in the audience today, um, go ahead and put your thoughts in the chat. If you have any practical advice you want to make sure to give to artists, Carol, let's hear from you. Go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to quickly say something I wish I had done from the very beginning is I set up a cataloging system for my work because it's, it's caused me all kinds of problems. I have piles of artwork and I will, sometimes I'll show something online. I had somebody, I showed something online, someone wanted to buy it. I didn't know where it was. I showed something online and it took me three weeks to find it. I never did find the other one. So anyway, um, a cataloging system, if you do a lot of production, um, would make things a lot simpler because now I'm just inundated. I don't even know how to approach it. Thanks. Oh, I think that that's great. And I know that that is advice that um, as photographers, I think we are lucky that in general, in the beginning of our career, that often gets driven home, what our workflow and our indexing and everything should be. But I think you're absolutely right, being able to build that catalog so you know where things are and what they're part of and when they were made and all of that good stuff is really important. So I hope folks take that advice. And even um, even photographers, we often could clean things up better than we do um, and make sure that our files have a system that's easy to follow and repeatable all through our archive and that we're naming them in a way that makes them easy to find and all of that good stuff. So yeah, super, super important. Thanks for sharing that, Carol. Juliet, would love to hear from you as well. What is your practical advice? Um, 
I forget what made me raise my hand, but then after listening to you talking about like not getting anxious because you you know you have a little when you have a little bit of a track record, there could be there's ebbs and flows. But so the word that I was thinking was that you you trust yourself, and as long as you're working, like for me, as long as I'm working, I know that I'm evolving and growing. So even when something's done, like there's a new website, like you don't fool yourself because in six months or in a year you're going to be having a different perspective, and so you know, you just try, I just trust that I'm on a path and I'm learning and growing and it's going to keep changing. Ooh, I love that. I think that's a really, really powerful piece of practical advice, which is trust yourself. Um, and you're right. And I'm an anxious person in general. And so I am absolutely apt in certain areas to fall back into the habit of being like, oh, is there going to be enough work? And I'm, I'm not going to make it this month. And I'm, oh, you know, start to panic and then fall into the trap that David mentioned, which is, you know, make a lot of decisions out of fear. And that's certainly never a good idea for me. So going back to that trust and to knowing, hey, we've always made it. Look, we've always made it. Um, do the practical things that I know always bring in work. And what does that? Well, when I post about things in certain places or when I talk to certain people or whatever it is, I always end up getting work. And, and one more thing, actually, I just thought of right now is don't be afraid to ask for work. Really, like, don't be afraid to ask for work. Um, to, to go into the places where your networks are and say, hey, I have an opening if anybody wants this thing. Or just a reminder, I do these kinds of things. If you need this right now, I cannot tell you how many times these things that I considered at the time throwaways, like I'll just let folks know real quick because I have a minute and there's an opening and all of a sudden now five people have responded and I don't even have time to, to get to all of them. Um, you would be surprised how often just asking for work really will show up for you. So there's there's another one for you. As we come to the end of the hour, I want to ask the moderators and the folks on the panel today, any final thoughts on practical advice for artists or anything that uh, you thought of while other folks were giving their their practical advice? I know we got a little bit from, from everybody, but would love to hear some final thoughts. Yeah, I was thinking throughout the, our talk today, maybe this is not on a practical scale, but I find it extremely important is, especially for starting artists, and, and, and not just for starting artists, but for as, as you grow, is find your tribe, find your community. Uh, you know, it's all about learning and growing. And for me, I credit most of, most of the learning, and or at least the awareness of what's out there and what is possible and how people approach things is through, uh, you know, having a community, uh, joining communities, exchanging with people, uh, connecting with people. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's a powerful way to to find your way through uh, the unknown as as you start and as you grow. And it's important to recognize also that as you grow and your needs change, your tribe and community may no longer be serving you, and it's time to change and look for other connections and other relationships. So I, I I think it's fundamentally and it's important to do that, to have that support and have that 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 outlet. Uh, and source uh, that you can go to and and uh, and to help you grow. Yes, find your tribe, find your people, build a network. I love it. So so important. Anybody else? Final thoughts today? No, but I'd love to keep this conversation going in the Facebook group. Um, because as we start to chat, I'm sure there'll be a lot more stuff that comes out of this. So um, go ahead into the Facebook group and just throw that in. What's your what's your piece of practical advice? And we can continue a conversation there um, because I, I know you all have stuff. Um, it's not just the four or five things that we've talked about. So um, I'd love to hear what you do, whether it's, you know, practical advice on a wide scale or something, you know, just that you do daily. I'd love to hear what other people have. I'm always picking up that kind of stuff. I'm a sponge for it. Yep. Agreed. Um, and just as a quick example for what Bassam was mentioning, I've been lucky enough to have my dear friend Olga Timyanyan with me this week, this last couple of weeks. Um, and we have been creating together and it has reminded me because of course, over the last couple of years with COVID and, you know, isolation and not being able to be with or around people as much as I'm used to, 
I had forgotten a little bit the difference between being able to chat with people online and being able to create with somebody in person and what it feels like for that creative energy to be flowing and for the lack of competition to be there where we are both working toward the same goal and coming up with and sharing ideas and watching those ideas evolve and become something bigger and stronger and more compelling than it would have if it had just stayed in my head or maybe I had even just chatted with a friend online about it. Um, being able to be around folks and and work and create and do that is a really, really powerful thing. And um, there's a reason I think some of the most famous artists were friends with some of the most famous artists because those rising tides raise all ships. And when you have those people influencing your life and when you build those relationships and that creative energy gets flowing, there really is nothing that can replace that. So definitely encourage folks to be thinking about about that as a practical piece, important practical piece of making art for sure. All right, now that we are at the end of the hour, first wanna say thank you to everybody who participated in the conversation today for Sharon up in Facebook land. I hope the answers were helpful for Carol and Juliet. Thank you for coming up and sharing your thoughts. For the coach, we're so glad that you're here. I hope you come back more, we miss you. Um, and of course, the regular mods who are here all the time, donating their time and having these amazing conversations. Y'all know how much I love you and how grateful the community is to have you guys here. So glad, so glad. Um, all right, practical advice for today. There was a ton of it. Make sure you head over to the Facebook group and, and contribute and continue. Let's build a library of really fantastic practical advice for artists. We are switching again, just to remind everybody to Mondays and Fridays. So Monday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific, that's 9 a.m. Eastern time and afternoon for the friends overseas. Monday and Friday, those are the times we are getting together here live, not only on Clubhouse, but simulcasting through our Facebook page, our Facebook group, through YouTube also, and Stone Tree Creative. Um, we are joining forces in those areas and trying to get out as much great information on how to think like artists as possible. So we hope that you will continue to join us there. Also remember the artistforge.com is always open where articles and podcasts are going up all the time with fantastic information. You can head over there, get great information, share it all over the place, help your community have access to the kind of resources that we're providing here. And remember right now you can still go and get artist versus money ebook with fantastic advice on how to think about and build a healthy relationship with money. You can get that for free. We want to make sure that the community has access to that. So if you sign up for the newsletter, that is yours. It's a packed full of really great practical advice and also some philosophy to think about where money is concerned. So we hope that you will take advantage of that. Until Monday morning, go have a fantastic weekend, make beautiful, amazing things, share them with the world, and we will see you Monday morning, bright and early. Bye, friends. <laughs>